I'm going to talk about um, w one way that Daniel Diermeyer and I have been trying to approach framing to, from a quantitative perspective, sort of. And instead of looking at framing um, across parties and stuff like that, asking the question of, is a con this concept, in this case, framed X in this way or another, using it in a comparative fashion. So the first example I'll be using, and the one I'll be using throughout explaining what we're doing, is the war on terror. So I'm assuming everybody here is so familiar with that term now, it's become pretty much world famous. Um, it arose after a terrorist attack in 2001, and um, George Lakoff suggested that there were another possible framing that was contested to that um, beforehand, um, that was crime. So in this case, terror is framed in terms of war, so you send the military out, it's uh, combatants, you fight them, you win against them, or you lose against them. If it's a crime, then those are criminals, and you bring them to trial, and you see what happens, and you punish them, and et cetera, right? So those are two very different ways to approach terror. Um, so terror can, we, uh, so, Lake of Sopatis of Terror could have been framed as either a crime or an act, or an act of war, and, he's, he, and the claim is that act of war won. So that's a hypothesis, and can we test this? How do we test this type of hypothesis? So the first thing um, you might want to try, and that has been tried in the past in literature, is you basically take all the examples, and you look at them one by one, and you categorize them. So in 99, for example, we have the reign of terror, and then we have um, the terror of the Cold War, and after 2001, we suddenly have fight against terror, and uh, war against terror, and global war on terror, right? So there does seem to have been a shift even in this crude analysis. This is, I suspect this is not a very controversial type of uh, claim that um, there is a framing in terms of war. But as a proof of concept, um, it's a good st first step, at least that's what we thought. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use semantic vector spaces, um, basically these sort of multidimensional spaces that are built based on the idea that words that occur together relate to the same topic. This is very much like um, what the talks before we were talking about. It's sort of the same idea. Um, you start with, word, with a pattern of word co-occurrence. You look which words occur with which words. Then you put some statistical um, mechanisms in, mach machinations in place, and you end up with this sort of vector space um, in which every word is described by a vector in that space, as a place in that space. Um, and basically the, the idea is that words that are, sim that are similar to each other, that occur in similar topics, appear close together in that space, okay? And that is the basic idea. So there are a lot of different ways of generating this space. Um, I don't have time to talk about them, but if you want, ask me afterwards. Um, they all give you the, sort of the same result. And in a toy space that I created just for the purpose of demoing this, this is not a real space by any means, um, what you can see is that we have two dimensions. In this case, we actually know what they are. One of them will be terror and one of them will be crime. And you have various words on each of the, that are in some place in that space where words that point in similar directions are similar in meaning. So for example, t fear and terrorists are very similar, right? They're both about terror. Um, so the standard measure that people use is the, cost the, is the angle, or the, more normatively, the cosine of the angle between vectors. So terrorists and assassin, for example, has an angle theta, which is smaller, and therefore they're closer together than the theta prime between terrorist and bribe, because terrorists don't bribe anybody. Um, yeah. Anyway, so important for the method I'll be presenting here today is that you can actually combine these vectors to create aggregate vectors. The way you do this is very similar. Say we're interested in the sentence, Joe is a terrorist and an assassin. We find the content word in that sentence, basically the words that carry meaning. In this case, those really terrorist and assassin. We find them in that space, and we do vector addition, which is basically just concatenation. The resulting vector points in the direction of the aggregate vector. And this is how we'll become computing context vectors. Okay? And the context vector is basically a vector representing the context, say a sentence or paragraph some people have actually used that as representing entire texts. Sort of an average vector of everything in that context. In a very similar way, you can also um, look at centroids, which are basically centers of mass of a set of vectors. You do pretty much exactly the same thing. Okay? So, once we have that, this, um, we can actually look and quantify framing by distances. Distances in this space. The idea is that framing in this case is how far is the concept from its possible frame. The closer they are, the more, more likely it is that it is framed using that term, right? So we can, for example, in what I will do in this first analysis is look at shifts in framing. Do those distances change over time? In this case, a result of 2001, right? You can then, you have sets of vectors, you have numbers, distances are actually scalar, so you can actually do a lot of different hypothesis testings. Um, I will not bother you with all the types of different analysis that you can do here. You can imagine them for yourself. Um, there are a lot of different ways people have, and other things that people have tried to do for this. 
Again, I don't have time to get into them, but if you're interested, um, I can give you pointers. The corpus I'll be using for the first two analysis is um, based on the US Senate. It's speeches in the US Senate, 89 to 2006. Okay, it was collected by Bay Yu. And for the first analysis, as I mentioned, we're interested in the war on terror. So our, we look at the word terror and our two possible frames, war and crime. And we can do a qualitative analysis, which basically is measuring distances, or we can visualize this by using statistical techniques to reduce the multidimensional space to two dimensions and create things like this movie here, which you're seeing is basically three the, the representation of the three clusters. And what we're interested in in this case is sort of how close is terror to war or to crime. You can see that generally it's closer to war, and we'll see that in the later analysis as well. But after 2001, what you see is that they actually become much more consistently close and much more overlapping, which is basically the type of framing that we're talking about here. So this is how it looks when you look just at the distances. And again, you can see after 2001, there is a dramatic drop in the distance between terror and war. Terror is sort of the zero point here. The lower you are, the closer you are. The idea here is that we're using a semantic vector space to calculate the distances between the, the, the uses of the word terror, for example, in this case, which is a concept where we're looking, and it's two possible frames of war and crime. The, more, the closer the, something is to terror, which is a focus here, the lower it is. Basically, think of terror as a line down here. Okay, So we see the shift here. And uh, however, we can also see that same shift that we just looked at how frequency do the terms war and crime occur within that window of terror. Um, however, that is true if we look at war and crime. If instead of war we're looking at battle, you get the same pattern as we saw before for semantic for distances. You don't get that for um, for uh, co-occurrence frequencies because battle rarely, if ever, like crime, co-occurs with terror. So this, the idea here is that one thing you buy by doing this is that you get a lot more leeway in which words you actually choose as a frame because you're choosing more of a semantic field than a specific word. This has drawbacks as, as well as advantages, but I don't have time to get too much into that. Um, so as a second example, instead of looking over time, let's look across parties. One debate that divide the, divides the U.S. a lot is abortion. And basically there are two camps, the Democrats which um, endorse the woman's right to choose and control her body, and the Rep Republicans which endorse um, the fetus's right to life, seeing that as a living organism. So first we can just look at keywords of choice and life. Again, these are distances from abortion. And what you can see is that um, in this case, um, Democrats are closer to, than the Republicans. In this case, you see a shift the other way, as you might expect based. However, a less, a less intuitive, perhaps, analysis is looking at terms that relate to this sort of definition of life, in this case, mother and woman, whereas mother is very life-centric because it already implies there is a living kid, whereas woman does not. And uh, here you see a big difference between the parties. For woman, pretty much no difference for, for woman, a big difference for mother. So once more, we can see that. And an interesting question you can ask now is, how is this portrayed in the media? If you look, for example, there is a cor available corpus of the New York Times from 18, 89, 88 to 2008. And you can see that this pattern, preference for woman over mother and choice over life, is very much like the Democrats. The New York Times is a well-known uh, left-leaning paper. So one final example. Um, genetic engineering. Um, in this case, there were not a lot of examples in the Senate corpus, so this analysis is based on the New York Times. Um, even then, there wasn't that many. The idea is that genetic engineering had, has two major fields of application. One is known as red biotech, which is medical applications, green biotech, which is agricultural applications. Um, there was a big um, shift in perception towards agricultural applications after um, Monsanto introduced Roundup Ready soybeans, which are ready for their um, herbicides, so it doesn't destroy them. Um, that will have occurred in 1995, and if you look at genetically engineered with two focus words of agriculture and medicine, you can see that shift right here. Okay, so we can see that shift here. Again, we saw this for terror, not, perhaps not that big of a surprise. However, however you can do some, some other interesting things here. I don't have a lot of time to get into this. This is something we've just been trying recently. This is basically correlations between um, the, the, the context distances from medical and medicine and improvement and danger and all these four words here. These are positive, these are negatives. The idea is that red biotech has generally been uh, described as um, improving quality of life and things like that, whereas agriculture has been focusing on the dangers of, of having such thing as modifying our food base. Um, one other thing that's of interest in this specific analysis is instead of genetic engineering, you look at biotech or biotechnology, both of these terms show similar things. You see the shift here, but it's very, very small. It's much smaller than you saw for genetic engineering. 
However, there is something going on here that this, this graph does not show. And we see if we go to the two-dimensional reproductions that I, we'll, we saw in a movie form earlier, what you're seeing is that biotech starts as a really small circle right here within medicine. And over time, it expands. This type of expansion does not show in those distance graphs because the center of mass moved very little. If you look, it starts over here, here, here. It basically moves a little, but not by much. But the expansion of biotech um, is kept best captured by another um, parameter, which I use to term semantic density. Um, that was when I was looking at uh, historical change in linguistics. But um, basically, so there are other types of change that you can get from this method that s simple distances do not show you. Okay. So I hope I, I convince you a little bit that you can use uh, corpus semantic, corpus uh, statistics like this to um, answer questions about things like framing, that it's a useful metric. Um, it's one of, some of the advantages are that because it's a computer-based method and very little human intervention, it's very scalable, it's very efficient. It also provides you with objective metrics, with, a qual with qualitative data, numbers basically, that are not based on human interpretation. So it gives you some sort of starting point for further analysis, interpretive analysis. Um, I want to stress, as you might have seen in the graphs, framing is, din is dynamics. Um, it changes over time. It's very interactive with other things that happen. So you have to take care when anal analyzing framing, both objectively and interpretively. Um, the, the statistics I'm using here control for that to a degree, but not to entirely. So it's something to, to think of. Um, one thing is that um, the method that I've been describing here for using for framing um, is very similar to methods that people have tried in linguistics for con contextual disambiguation of terms. And Daniel and I, we think that there is, it's not by a coincidence. There are a lot of similarities between framing and contextual disambiguation, but there's, we think there are also some differences and we want to try and tease those two apart and see whether we can actually statistically differentiate them. Um, besides that, one, one up, up approach that you can use this little, little, little to no intervention method is basically just throw it into the water, take a corpus, and tell, tell us, what, given a word, terror, what is, are its pos possible frames? So we have some methods that we're trying to develop to do that. And once we have that, we can actually take the two methods together and basically give a corpus, tell the system, okay, find terms, find their frames, and see whether those frames change, and tell us what's interesting that's going on here. Okay, so given a corpus, within hours, you might be able to get everything that's in there in terms of framing. Again, ideal, ideally, probably not really, but we'll see. Thank you.